All right, let's go ahead. I think almost everybody's here. Thank you all, and I, and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, thank you all so much for coming uh, today to this workshop on Inclusive Teaching 101. Um, I just want to, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us face-to-face -face and say, please feel free to get more lunch as we go along and get something to drink. I want to also welcome everybody who's joining us online. We are doing something new in CAT where we are live streaming our workshops in hopes that um, you know, more faculty can participate and also we're capturing them. So this is being recorded, not your faces or anything, uh, but it is being recorded so that then we can uh, uh, have these and then faculty who can't make it can go back and look at them. So be sure that you are, um, when you read Jay's emails now, you'll notice he's got this week in the center and what's coming up. And then he also has what happened last week. So if there's topics that you miss, you're gonna be able to go see if, if they were live streamed and recorded, you can see them there. Also, I will point out that there's markers at the tables because we are gonna do some interaction. And so that is picking you up. So if you uh, <laughs> whisper too loud, you'll be able to get hurt. So I just wanna say that. Um, and um, I also want to say to the people who are uh, participating virtually that you can ask questions through the chat Janice Floret is serving as the voice of the chat today, and so she can pick up the questions and be sure that they can get answered for us. Um, but I'm really glad that you're here today. I think this is a very um, important topic, inclusive teaching. It's something that uh, is being talked about a lot now in faculty development. I think it's really important at an HBCU, and, I'm, and I am excited to unveil Kat's new initiative about it at the end of this workshop. Um, so what I hope to accomplish today in this workshop is to introduce you to the idea of inclusive teaching, to describe the principles, basic principles of inclusive teaching, to discuss ways to use these in your classroom. So today we're going to focus on classroom interaction only, and then unveil the new CAT initiative that I mentioned. Um, I just want to say that I too am just learning a lot about this topic. So I'm learning right along with you, but we're learning from some, some really good people here. So I'm excited about that. Before we begin, I just wanna say the basic assumption of inclusive teachers, teaching though, is that instructors should create classrooms where students feel like they belong and feel like they can do well. Okay, that's the basic assumption underlying all of this. And this is my class from a couple semesters ago. And so when I look at this picture, I see each of them individually, each of their individual stories, each of the individual strengths that they brought to this class. And as a believer in inclusive teaching, then the assumption I have is that it's my job to make sure that the activities and approaches I use in my classroom, make sure that they feel like they belong there and that they can, everybody can thrive there, right? If they do the work, if they do the work, they can thrive there. So that's the basic assumption underlying <clears throat> inclusive teaching. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I'm asking you all to think about this as a value that you hold and how, how you hold that. Um, so for a definition, I just want to give you this definition from Ohio State University, uh, CAT, okay, their Center for the Advancement of Teaching. There are different definitions that in a, you know, a whole bunch of people divide it, uh, define it different ways, but all of them have the common thing of all students. Like that's what's emphasized in all of these definitions. So in this definition here from Ohio State that I really like is inclusive teaching describes the range of approaches to teaching. Okay, so notice it's not talking about content. It's talking about the teaching methods and our approaches to teaching that consider the diverse needs and backgrounds of all students to create a learning environment where all students feel valued and where all students have equal access to learning. Okay, so it's creating this learning environment that was open and comfortable for all students, okay? Um, basically, it's a, embracing student diversity as an asset and then using that knowledge then to inform the, our teaching approaches. And I just wanna point out that diversity is really broad, right? So we're talking diversity in, in a lot of different ways, race, ethnicity, gender identity, not gonna read the whole thing, but even down to personality. Think about personality traits that extroverts in our class versus introverts, introverts in our class. Do some of them get privileged over others in class discussions or in other activities, learning activities that we're designing? That's what inclusive teaching is asking you to do and think about. Are you meeting the needs of all students there? 
<clears throat> so today, what I want to do is point out um, some of the, the principles and ideas behind this, and it comes from True Experts, who is uh, uh, VG Sathy and Kelly Hogan. And um, Sathy is a, a psychologist and neuroscientist, by the way. And this is an article they wrote for the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and it was just published this past July. And so they have been doing, they have a whole uh, mm, wor workshop that they put on, um, on inclusive teaching, and there's, they speak on it all over the country. I think, I'm looking at Stacy here, I think we should really think about um, her for the grant. She would be fantastic. Okay, right, so um, <clears throat> they do really, really good work. So we are in, in good hands on doing this. So I'm basing this presentation on this article that was in the Chronicle and, um, and the, the information that they, they presented there. Okay, so first are the guiding principles of inclusive, of inclusive teaching. <coughs> Excuse me, the guiding principles of inclusive teaching according to Sathy and Hogan. Okay, they have three main principles um, that they use to guide their work on inclusive teaching. <coughs> and the principle number one is that inclusive teaching is a mindset. Okay, and it's a mindset for us, the instructors, not for students. We're used to thinking about student mindsets, right? And growth versus fixed mindset. We'll actually talk about that in a minute, but we're used to thinking about students' mindsets for learning. This is a mindset for us as instructors. And they argue that um, inclusive teaching is a mindset. And it's a mindset where you are constantly asking yourself, whose voice am I leaving out? Or whose voice is, am I privileging in all of our teaching approaches? So whether it's through classroom interactions, discussions, um, whether it's through assignments, tests, you know, who's, whose voice am I leaving out and whose voice am I privileging? And also, are, you know, who is feeling isolated or like they don't belong by any of my teaching methods or approaches okay, that I do too. And so it's seeing diversity as a, as a asset, okay? So it's this mindset that we have where we're kind of constantly, just like we would ask about, um, <laughs> Uh, teaching approaches in terms of like, how is this meeting my objective in my course, right? How is this meeting the, you know, is, is this teaching the content that I want to teach? A mindset for inclusive teaching is, is this meeting all students? Okay, so it's a mindset. That's the first principle. Second principle <clears throat> is the more structure, the better for all students. Okay, now this, what we're going to talk about, I, there's some pushback to some of these, and we'll, I've got some space for us to talk about those. But they argue that the more structure you can give students, the more helpful it is for all students. Um, those who need structure, and this is often first generation students, underrepresented students, um, those who need the structure because they just don't know what you're, is expected of them, providing the structure helps them. Those who already know, providing the structure doesn't hurt them, right? Um, and so, uh, they argue that providing provide structure for students is really important in inclusive teaching. Otherwise, you're leaving out the people who don't know what you want them to know. Now, there's a whole, and we've been doing some work in this in CAT, there's a whole movement um, in teaching called transparency and learn in teaching and learning, learning and teaching, it's still transparency and learning and teaching. And um, we're gonna do some, as part of this initiative, we're gonna do some more workshops on this, and I really encourage you to think about this but transparency in teaching and learning is a um, whole, uh, whole movement, and they've got a ton of data that just shows doing transparent assignments, which is, there's a template for transparency, and again, that's a whole different workshop, but providing structure for students really, really helps students who, especially first-gen, especially underprepared, especially underrepresented. So providing the more structure you can give the students, the better. Now, this is different than hand-holding, right? And that's the pushback is, is it providing structure hand-holding? Um, and they argue, no, it is not. It's telling the students it's teaching. They argue it's teaching, right? Because why should students walk into your class and know what is expected of your discipline? That's what you're there to teach them. So you provide this structure and you scaffold it. And then as, as you go along, and then you can kind of let them do more and more. You know, you can be less structured as you move, move along. But they argue that more structure is actually better for all students. And then uh, to go hand in hand with that, the last principle is they argue that too little structure hurts some students. So where having structure just helps everybody, too little structure actually leaves some students behind, right? Um, and 
again, if you think about this in terms of students who don't know what you want, working with them and telling them, okay, this is what's expected for this assignment, or this is how you learn this content can help them without hurting others. Whereas if you don't do that at all, it doesn't hurt the group who can do it, but it does hurt the group that can't. Can you, and again, mindset of inclusive teaching is we're gonna meet everyone where they are and train them on this content. Um, so there are, there are some, so in my work with CAT, there have been some instances where I've worked to faculty on this who say, well, learning to think like this, and I'm not gonna fill in any disciplinary blank, but learning to think like X um, is part of my hidden curriculum, and I want them to learn to do that. Okay, well, if it's part of your curriculum, if this is an objective, then you're going to teach them to do that, just like you teach them that objective. I've also heard from faculty, well, these are students are graduate students or seniors or juniors, again, what X put that in there, they should know this, okay? Well, if they're in your classrooms and they don't know this, teach them this and then let them fly, right? Scaffold it up and then let them fly. That's what, the, that's what Sathy and Hogan are arguing here, okay? Is the basic principles of inclusive teaching. Um, okay, enough talking for me right now. We're going to do, we're going to do a think pair share. So for those of you who are attending virtually, what I would ask you to do is follow the rules of this think pair share. And then uh, when it comes time to pairing up and sharing, you're gonna pair online. So if you can do that. So here's what I want to do first. I want to, you to actually think. I want you to take, and I'm gonna time you. I'm gonna give you two minutes. I want you to jot down your key ideas, but I want you to actually think. Now that you know what inclusive teaching is, right? You know the principles, the basic principles of it. How might you act more inclusively in your classroom? Now, this isn't like about assignments. We're not talking about course design. We're talking about in the classroom with your students. Now that you know this, and you probably already do a lot of it, so you can talk about what you do. Okay, but. Uh, take now that you know this take two minutes and think about this. I'm going to time you starting now. <coughs> Thank you. Who's doing that, you think? It is a virtual is it? Okay, so maybe mm, somebody who's writing on the screen, it's showing up on our screen. Just a, it sounds like a good idea, incorporate 
That's all I can read. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to move forward though, but um, there we go. Uh, Dorothy, I would like you to partner with, with Baha here. Syed and Sarah, if you all would partner. And I would like you to come over here with these men in here. All right, so that is our, and so online people, if you'll chat together. Um, that is our pairing. So we just paired. We have a, a, a um, triad here because we have an odd number. And now I'm going to give you three minutes to share your main ideas. I will tell you when you, I, when you hit the minute and a half mark so that you will know that you should let the other person talk. All right? Uh, go. <laughs> Okay, you're at your minute and a half, Mark, so make sure the other person has an opportunity to speak. Okay, so wrap up your conversation there. When I, we need this, this group needs 10 more seconds. <laughs> we had a group with three, so we're giving them 10 more seconds. Other, I'm letting the online people know other people are going up and renewing their food. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much for doing that. Now, what I would like you to do in your groups and then online people do it on the chat is find out whose birthday is closest to the day, to today. 
not saying what year you were born. No. I'm saying that your birth date, like mine's May 21st, your birth date, find out who's is closest to the day, either forward or backward, in each group. <laughs> <laughs> All right, have online people got it? We know Janice, whose birthday's closest? Okay, so for, as a birthday present, the non the uh, online and here, you are uh, in the three, you can pick pick somebody who is going to report. And the uh, pairs, the birthday person doesn't have to report, okay? And let's go, <laughs> there's a little birthday present. So uh, we'll start, so you pick somebody, whoever's closest. Okay, good. So what I just would like you to do is pick the uh, one, just pick one key thing you wanna talk about, about a way that you think you or someone in your group might act more, more inclusively in the classroom. So we all uh, focus less on the structure and more on how to get people's voices and how to pull out those people's voices who are not ready to uh, speak, mm -hmm. how to call them out if they're mm -hmm. and then encouraging those who keep speaking up to keep participating but not have their voices dominated to the entities. Excellent. And so, so some techniques were to sort of nervously spread around the question and point people or move the table to the lab or admit your own bad answers but have the barriers low or treat questions and bad answers by a hill. You help out the class because half the people had that long ago. So they just want to say it and then about to start talking on the hill. So we encourage you know, the response to how people ask questions, how to answer questions, how to make sure that they are not being done. Excellent. And you're going to find that overlaps with some of the research too. Yep, good. I collect all of those. <laughs> and I use them for Mm -hmm. I said that question. Oh. Yeah. I give them money. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you are doing that and everybody feels comfortable in an equal amount. Okay, we'll come back to we'll come back to some of those ideas. Here. Uh, so for us, uh, it was our structure. Uh, so for me, it was more so just um, incorporating like more technology into the class to give them more of a lecture. Mm -hmm. So finding a way to break up the lecture. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for him, it was more so. Um, oh, no, so we already, so we have one reporter. I should have even, I should have actually, when Muhammad said, if you want to report it, report it through your reporter, because I'm illustrating something. So one reporter and one key idea. So have you, yeah, have you said your key idea? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. And we can come back to that. Uh, this isn't a full group report out. I'm illustrating something and we will get there in a minute. So, Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I'm saying focus that, on that one. I, that I okay. <laughs> oh, is it your birthday? Yeah. Every day is the yeah. birthday. Okay. <laughs> I give her the ball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I think ours was structured as well. Um, I guess in the library, it can get a little not. I don't want to say complicated. But it can, especially with library instruction, things can fall out mm -hmm. of a pattern, or it needs, we need things to be a little bit more um, specific to what the professor is trying to do. Then, so offering more structured activities uh, based on the research that their their research project. Okay. Essentially, so more structured. More structured activities, which is something we're gonna head toward. Head toward. Okay, but thank you. Um, what came up on the chat? Um, the fact that they can't really hear the participants there, so we should have them. Thank you. Um, We're learning. This is our second time doing this. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We will uh, we'll come back to that then. A couple, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to this activity and use a couple things as illustrations, but also wanna see how your points show up in what Sathy and Hogan argue as ways to increase inclusivity in your classroom. Okay, so here we're focused on, not on like assignments are creating yet, we're focusing on classroom interactions and activities we do in our classroom. 
whether it's online or in the classroom. So the first thing they say as a wage increase is get comfortable with periods of silence in your classroom. So that's why I wanted to start with this think, pair, share and actually time the two minutes it takes you to think about it. We are disciplinary experts in our fields. We have PhDs and we're teaching this class to students who might be the first time they've even heard this lingo and we are doing it well and lecturing it well and we're organized, but it's still, and this is still the first time they're hearing some of this stuff. And we rarely give them time to think about it in class. Even if we do think pair share, which I really love, Sathy and Hogan call this the little black dress of, of active learning because you know, it's easy to do. Even when we do that, we often rush through the think part, right, and get to the share part. Or we just throw it out there cold. Who can come up with an example of this? And without giving them any time to think. And a lot of that, they argue, is because we are uncomfortable with silence in our classrooms. Even doing that, I use a timer to do two minutes, right? Because I thought, oh gosh, it's gotta be almost over and 26 seconds had gone by, right? So we've gotta get used to um, being comfortable with this. This allows people who are critical thinkers or who are reflective thinkers or who uh, you know, wanna think about things more deeply, this allows them time to do this. This is allows, it allowing time to think, allows students who are confused or who missed the last point, it allows them a chance to catch up. Um, it allows every, if you do this think, peer, share, and say, jot it down, even if they don't share out, like I was trying not to get everybody to share out, even if they don't share out, their voice was heard, right, because they, or their voice was included because they wrote it down. Their voice is included because they wrote it down and thought about it. So they're bringing their perspective to it. So um, it's a really good, uh, a good thing to do, to allow students to do this when you, when you had just presented something difficult, saying, okay, take two minutes and um, write it now in your own words. I just gave you the definition here on the slide, now write it in your own words, and I'm gonna time you. And providing the time, how long it's gonna take, and then actually timing it, the, providing the time gives them structure, right? Notice that was a very structured thing to share. We're gonna talk about the different structures as we go along. But it lets them know, okay, it's gonna be quiet for two minutes. And this is, this is the, the level of thought the teacher's expecting. And then also by timing it, it makes you be honest about the time and not rush through it. Okay, so getting comfortable with periods of silence in your classroom. Um, the, the next thing, and this kind of came up um, in a couple of different ones, Stacy and yours and, and another groups too, add structure to small group discussions. Okay, what happens if we're doing small group discussions or if we're just throwing it, you know, most of our classes are small. So even if we throw it out to the class, that would be considered a small class discussion is if you had a peer come in and observe your class, they would and count who was actually participating. You feel like, oh, this is great class participation. They really got it. And then your peer would tell you, well, actually if only five people talk to the whole time, right? And so, what happens is if you provide structure, then it can avoid that dominating voice if there's someone who just won't dominate, who just won't stop, or it can allow spaces for people who don't want to participate. I really should have with Syed, the group back here is who, and I know the online people couldn't hear, but we had a pair and he didn't want to present. So he said, oh, even though it's Sarah's birthday, he, he, she's going to do it anyway. And I kind of let that go because, you know, it's faculty. I'm but I should have said, nope, nope, you are you were assigned this role. And so that's one thing they talk about adding structure to small group discussions. Um, they, uh, Sathy and Hogan, they talk about assigning roles and rotating and assigning them after the fact. So nobody knows who's going to have to um, be the reporter. And you can do it with fun ways like whose birthday is coming up, who's got the craziest shirt, who had the most fun weekend. You can think of things. Or you can just say person on the left or... or Roll a dice. And you can do it anyway, but you can assign roles. You can assign, depending on what you're having them do, you can assign a note taker, you can assign a reporter, you can assign a skeptic, you can assign a yes person, you know, somebody to avoid groupthink, whatever, whatever depends on, on, the, on the discussion you're having. But by assigning roles, it really makes sure that people, it, that just not one person participates the whole time or that just takes over and the other people can, can just loaf and not get anything done. Also, you'll notice that I provided clear instructions. This is something, as I read the literature, it's really changed my teaching. I tend to just be an oral prompt person. I would say, okay, get, first I'll take two minutes and think about this, and then get in pairs and do this, and 
And what they, what um, Sethi and uh, Hogan argue is provide visual prompts. One thing is when you just throw out this oral prompt, maybe the students thinking about the notes you were just took, so they missed it, and now they are, you know, by, by reals they miss it, now they're embarrassed and they can't, you know, they can't move on. Also, if you have people who have hearing loss, who haven't or have hearing issues, um, and uh, some students who just might need a reminder of what it is as you go along. So, you know, building them in and providing visual props is a good way to go too. Mainly, this, this all comes back to principle two, which is structure never hurts, right? It only helps students know what to do. So add, add structure to your, your uh, discussions, even if they're large discussions. It could be, um, um, if it's, you know, got a group of 20 people and you do a lot of large class discussion, everybody who walks, you know, get a card, Everybody gets a card when you walk in, and you can only use your card one time, and everybody has to use their card by the end. You know, in that way, it's just it levels the playing field for discussions because they are more dominated than we think. Um, they also suggest allowing for anonymous participation for some things. Obviously, many things in our classes cannot be anonymous because they're graded, but not everything needs to be uh, needs to have the name on it, right? You can have anonymous discussions online. Um, this can be really um, helpful for introverts who don't want to participate or people who might hold unpopular minority opinions, right? And I also, I think in this politically charged climate, we need to think about that. What if somebody has an opinion that's kind of against the ongoing zeitgeist of the class, right? How comfortable do they feel um, now? Again, that depends on what kind of class you're teaching and that sort of thing, but I think it's important to think about. So for anonymous, uh, allowing anonymous participation, there are really low tech ways to do it. You can have anonymous note cards. So you can get note cards at the beginning of class. You can ask them, and you can do this in, in, a, in a STEM class too about content. Everybody write down what was the most confusing thing. And then you can then swap cards, and then swap cards again, and swap cards again. By the time, because by the time you've done that, nobody knows whose card they have, and then they can read out the cards. It's a way of, of doing it very low tech. Um, you can also do it high tech clickers and cahoots and top hats and that kind of thing. But think about, it. is there a way to just build some of those in there for some of the students who might be more con comfortable participating in an anonymous format? Um, well, um, another way you can do this is you can counteract self-perceptions that stunt student learning. Just like I said, inclusive teaching is a mindset for us. Our students often have mindsets about learning that really hurt them, right? And especially this is the fixed versus the growth mindset. The classic example of fixed mindset is I am not good at math, really, right? Which really that means is I have to put a lot of effort into learning math. And that's what we're here for is to put an effort and learn, right? And so changing them that this intelligence, IQ, not this fixed thing that, you know, what college is about isn't about I am not smart, so I can't do this. College is about, I'm going to learn from all these classes and build my knowledge. Um, so the way you can do that too, uh, fix versus to move students to, toward a growth mindset is talk to them about the imposter phenomenon. It is what it sounds like if you've not heard of the imposter phenomenon. It is feelings of, of being an imposter. I will share mine. I feel like any day they're gonna walk into CAT and go, why are you qualified to be the CAT director? I go, yeah, because there's so many more people who know so much more than me, right? So you kind of sharing that with students that because they're at the beginning, they might even feel like the imposters even being in college, right? Not just with the content, but being in college and saying, just saying explicitly, no, you belong here. Everybody has feelings of imposter phenomenon sometimes, and then you belong here. And then just sharing your own learning, right? Sharing that you're not an expert in everything and you have to learn things too. That can help students count, see that uh, growth, mind, uh, growth mindset in action. And then finally, um, connect with students personally. Okay, connecting with students personally. And this is things that you would expect, right? Use the, try to use their names, try to learn their names, use their names. Try to uh, uh, learn their preferred pronouns and respect that if they have pronouns that are, that are uh, counter to what you think. Um, use your email. We, now through Brightspace, you can just email people so easily. Right, if somebody miss, you know, and get depending on class size and depending on um, your own teaching style, 
somebody misses turning an assignment, go to, you can go to Brightspace and click, find all users without submissions and send them an email right then and just say, I noticed you didn't turn it in. I hope everything's okay. Um, sending them, uh, sending students who did really well, gosh, you did really well on that discussion today. You know, just the, using the email to kind of connect with students. We can do that a lot. And then again, doing it fairly, um, doing little check-ins. Um, sharing information about yourself. This is another way to connect with students. Again, they don't want to just hear your whole life story. They want to learn the content. But uh, James Lang, who also is an author for the Chronicle about pedagogy, he talks about students are not brains on sticks. And he says, neither are faculty brains on sticks. So why do we treat a lecture hall? Like these are just a bunch of brains. Here's my brain. And this is our, this is the only interaction we're having. All right. So be, you know, let them know that you have a dog and a kid and that kind of thing. Um, okay, perfect timing here. So some frequently asked questions that Safi and Hogan have come, have come, have come across. These are common questions they've come across when people are first starting to think about this. People say, I don't teach about diversity. It doesn't have anything to do with my content. So why, sh why do I need to think about this, right? Because people at first were thinking inclusive teaching is I've got to have a component. Here we are in Black History Month, right? I've got to have a component on the black scholars in my field, or I've got to you know, have a diversity topic. That's not what this is about. Although that's really nice, and especially at our school, if you can bring in non-white authors, non-white guest speakers, this is great. But um, what inclusive teaching is about is about our teaching methods. It's about our pedagogy, not about our content. Um, next one, are the tools of inclusive teaching, isn't this just hand-holding? Students should be expected to learn on their own. And I would argue that they don't know even how to learn. Why would they know how to read an intro psych textbook before they got in my class? They'd never done it before. So why would they know how to do this? And part of my training is to teach them how to learn to, to learn my discipline, learn to learn it, not just the content itself. So I believe the answer to the second one isn't just, um, it's teaching, right? Uh, structure, providing structure and being inclusive is teaching. It's not handholding, it's teaching. It's what we should do. And then again, let them fly. And this one, uh, again, we get a lot here at Xavier. Uh, my course has so much content I need to get through. I cannot do this. <laughs> Okay. And again, what Safi and Hogan would say is this is not about the content. We're not asking you to cut content. This is about tweaking the ways you interact, tweaking your assignments, tweaking the things you already do to be sure that the content's actually getting to people, right? I also really like it because every discipline thinks they're the only ones that have so much content, they can't do anything. But <laughs> that's just an aside. Um, okay, so tips for inclusive course design. Like this cat, you're gonna to have to wait on it because that's another workshop and it's coming up in, in March. And we're gonna talk about, uh, so now we're doing, we, we've talked about how interaction in classroom and then we're gonna talk about it in designing the actual course and designing assignments and that sort of thing. So um, wait for it, it's gonna be fun. Um, okay, so that leads to CAT's new initiative, which is a community of practice for inclusive pedagogy. And I really hope that everyone who's here, you're here because you like this topic or maybe you're stuck in the library, but um, I really hope that you are interested in this. This is funded by the Mellon Foundation and it's in partnership with our Center for Equity, Justice and the Human Spirit. And it is, the purpose is to get as many Xavier faculty as possible. Mm. Oh, online people, we are going to email this to you as soon as, you can see it on the slide, but we will email it to you as soon as the workshop's over. Um, and what this is, is this is developing our expertise. Like I said, I'm not an expert in this, and so we are going to become experts together on campus for this. Um, the uh, purpose of it is to provide us with the knowledge, to provide us with the strategies from the real experts. It is, we can do this for Lent. Right? So what do you wanna do for Lent? You wanna become an inclusive teacher. Love it. So it starts, it's six weeks only. It starts right after Mardi Gras and it ends before Easter. And it is a, a MOOC, a massive online, what's it MOOC stand for, Janice? Massive online, mm, it's an online course. <laughs> it's on, yeah, open, open, massive open online course. Uh, it's run by Columbia University 
and they, it's really well, and so I've taken this class. It's really well produced. It's really uh, well done. It is, it takes two to three hours per week, and it really does just take two or three hours per week. So this isn't uh, getting, you know, th th that's the full story. Again, I've done this, takes two to three hours per week. They have experts in the field from all over talking about the research on this, the um, kind of the psychology behind this. It's really a great course. So what we're going to do is take this course together and, and the Mellon Foundation is paying for us all to get us certified. So you, if you pay for it, you get the certificate at the end of it. And there's a couple of extra you know, things you have for it. Um, and then during that time, we will meet three times. Depending on the number, we'll probably get into smaller groups to meet. But we'll meet at the beginning of the course. We'll meet at about week three of the course. And then we'll meet at the end. And we will just, again, kind of talk about how does it relate to Xavier's, Xavier's um, unique culture. And then people who do this finally, then they will be involved in workshops like this moving forward. So you can start talking about inclusive teaching within your own departments and your own specific fields and not just a general overview like this. Um, I really hope that you're interested in doing this. Um, this is all that's due, uh, all you have to do to apply for this is send me an email by next Friday and with a two statements, one just saying why you're interested in doing this and the other one saying that you, you um, uh, commit to participating fully in it, okay? Um, it's going to be a really great uh, thing. I hope a lot of people do it. So I, you're getting a sneak preview. This afternoon, I'm going to send this out to all faculty and think about doing it for Lent. There we go. Um, so any, any, we've got just the five minutes left. Any questions or comments or anything people want to say about this initiative or about inclusive teaching in general? Thank you, Erica. And if you would um, speak into the microphone. Uh, I, I guess what I was going to say is um, I'm kind of looking forward to the more, I guess, kind of go to the full pedagogical side in terms of what you keep saying, like, you need to provide structures. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be honest, I don't necessarily really even know what these structures are. Yeah. I realize in hearing some of the things, I'm like, oh, I kind of do that. And I guess. That is structure, but I mean, no to recognize it as structure. Yeah. So, so, so let's start with the in class, like in the mm -hmm. activities and stuff that you do, start doing some of those things here, and then we're going to get to the assignments. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's really easy. And it's very transparent. You know, it's, it's, I should say, easy. It is, um, it is tweaks. It's not changes, it's not overhauls, it's tweaks, but it's, it, it transformed my assignments for sure. Yep. Good. I'm glad you're looking forward to that. That would be our next, our next workshop. Mm -hmm. One question from the chat. Um, how can you incorporate these same techniques in a large classroom setting? Yes. Okay, so Sathy and Hogan talk about that. But if you go back and look at the, um, let me just back up. If you go back and look at the practices here, that all of these can be done no matter what class size you are doing. Because if you are doing, because first of all, I would argue that in a large classroom setting, you should be interactive lecturing, where about every 12 minutes, you do a little engagement point. And when those are engagement points are small group, then you should be adding structure to them. When the engagement, and you should, when the engagement points are thinking, then you should be building time for thinking. And when the engagement points are, um, yeah, so you should follow that. In a large class, you can also have uh, anonymous participation and things. So really all of these hold can connect with students. In a large class, you might not be able to connect by knowing their name, but you can do things in Brightspace like putting your profile picture on Brightspace, putting some information about your bio in there, asking them to put profile pictures on there, you know, kind of building it, building it that way. Have a little personality. I have a friend who um, always matches her clothes to her background of her slides. I don't have that kind of time, but so if her slides might have a like a, a, a traffic theme one year, I mean one day, and so then she will wear something that looks traffic-y, and yeah, and after a while students kind of catch on, and but again, it just makes her human and not just this brain on a stick. Good question though, thank you. The what? I, I went there, that's it's a, an article of the whole book. 
Chronicle for the Oh, that's that's just a commercial for that in on the oh, Chronicle. Okay. So he was asking. There's a there's a book on the if you go if you go online and see the article. There's a little book there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, but that is the article. Article's really good. But yes, we are getting some definitely definitely starting to build our resources in CAT on inclusive teaching. This is going to be something we're going to be working with. And I'm thrilled that you are here. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to think about this. This is important stuff. So I really appreciate it. So thank you all. Give yourself a hand for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks online participants. I will be sure to send you the handout first. Over and out. <laughs>